Welcome to Wine Soundtrack USA. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities, and passions. Hello, friends of Wine Soundtrack. This is Allison Levine, and today I'm on the Silverado Trail north side in St. Helena, Napa Valley, and I'm sitting with Luke Clayton, who's the assistant winemaker at the famous Rombauer Winery. Welcome, Luke, and tell us a little bit about uh, Rombauer and where you're located. Yeah, thanks. So, uh, Rombauer's a family owned and operated uh, um, winery. We've been around for 38 years. Um, Basically, we're located five minutes north of St. Helena. Uh, originally started by Kuna Rombauer, who uh, used to be a pilot for Braniff Airlines, and then they shifted him out here in the uh, late 70s. And then um, he caught the wine bug, and in 1980, decided to get some Cabernet grapes from Stag's Leap, and that's when it all started. Made it in his garage up here on the hill, and um, from there, he got Chardonnay in 82, and we've never looked back. And how many acres do you have? Uh, we've got a little over 500 acres that we own, and then we also purchase fruit of um, long-term growers that uh, have been around the valley in Sonoma for a long time. And how many cases of wine do you produce? Yeah, so we get asked that one a lot, actually. Um, so basically we're a medium-sized family uh, winery, which is like about uh, from 50,000 cases to 500,000 cases. And so we're just in the middle of that, roughly. So I know you were saying to me you produce about 300,000 cases. The predominance of that is your famous Chardonnay at 200,000 cases, but you're also producing, uh, what are some of the other wines that you're producing? Yeah, so we also um, have our Chardonnay, of course, and then uh, we have Zinfandel, our Merlot Cabernet, and our uh, new baby, which we've only made, I believe we're on our fourth vintage, is our Sav Blanc. Fantastic. And what markets can your wine be found in? Oh, uh, we're pretty much uh, all over the States. Um, an easy way to find out if you go on our webpage, rombauer.com, and um, you click on the location and put in your zip code, you can find out where we are, or you can um, call one of the lovely ladies in the, uh, the wine club and they can sort you out as well. Fantastic. So I want to know what your first memory um, of wine is, a memorable you know, experience where it turned you on to wine. Obviously, you're Australian, not American. I don't know if it was back there or if it was here. Ah, well, I remember my first time I had wine. Uh, I didn't like it. I was at a wedding, cousin's wedding, but um, I was actually uh, just uh, lucky that I fell into it, actually. I was graduating um, high school back home in Adelaide, Australia, and I was like, oh, I better go find something to do at college, and I uh, went to a couple of open days, and I went to a, a winemaking one and they was a bit indoors, outdoors, and I thought, oh, well, I like outdoors and making wine sounds like fun. My folks drink wine, so sure, I'll give it a go. And four years later, I had a piece of paper and went out and did my first cellar job and loved it, thankfully. And that's that's basically how I started. No, no romantic story about tasting some French wine. It was uh, dumb luck and lucky I... I like wine and I like a few drinks and <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> that's how I ended up here as well. So I was, uh, that's great. Um, do you think that there's a perfect variety? Oh, well, that's, <laughs> that's subject to, I think that's subject to basically what you like. Um, I think if you wanted to say one, would probably be Chardonnay just because you can make so much with it. So you can make champagne with it. You can make a light style, um, stainless style, malo, full malo like ours, or you can do a late harvest and just got a big big range of variety, but that one probably is a big debate I think over a couple of bottles of wine I would say <laughs> um, When you're thinking about it, someone who doesn't drink wine, what do you think they're losing out on by not drinking your wine? Oh, oh, not, not drinking our wine? <laughs> well, oh, you're missing out on a lot, but just I always say um, people say what wine to drink. I say drink what you like. Everyone's different. I know when I first started here I did not like our Chardonnay and now I I drink a fair bit of it and it's just you just drink what you like and you evolve in your as you age and your experiences and now if you're not drinking Rombau you're missing out that's for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah we got we got the from the beginner one to high-end cab that you know you can sell her and drink with your friends later on and 
Well, speaking of sellers, do you have a seller? And if so, what's the most expensive bottle you've got in there right now? Oh, yeah, I have a seller, but it doesn't stay full very long. That's the problem. <laughs> um, expensive bottle. I have a, let me see. Yeah, it'll be a Kays Brothers from McLaren Vale. It'll be a Block 6 uh, Old Vine Shiraz. Um, those vines are over 120 years old. And, uh, yeah, so I think it's about $100, $150 bottle. That's about it. And of the wines that are in your cellar, what's giving you the most satisfaction to drink right now? There's a bottle of bubbles, the Rev there, I've been eyeing off that I really want to drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then let's jump right into this part about, as a consumer, do you prefer white, red, or rosé? At the moment, I would probably go red, but it, it depends on uh, time of year. Like, you know, end of year, party season, uh, you can't go wrong without bubbles. Summertime, it's probably white, and in a couple of months, I'll be drinking more and more red, I reckon. Yeah, it's Genius. time and place. It is. I would is. agree with that. Um, if you had a choice, still or sparkling? Uh, yeah, <laughs> late to scourge, sparkling, I like. Yeah. And um, when it comes to sparkling, are, is your preference towards champagne or from somewhere else? Everywhere. I, I, I like champagne, and then, but also, you know, there's some great places here in Napa to, to hit up. You, know, you can't go wrong with Schramsberg down the road or Domaine Canaris. Uh, I love those places to hit up. And when it comes to pairing food and wine, how do you feel? Do you follow all the rules, or have you ever broken the rules and had white wine with red meat, red wine with white meat? Yeah, all the time. I, I don't follow any rules on that. I just uh, basically I drink what I feel like at the time, you know. It's, um, <laughs> drink Chardonnay, I Chardonnay all the time with steak, red meat, and, you know, I, I could have a bowl of red with fish if I wanted to. I just, uh, most of the time, I just drink because I enjoy you know having a glass after work is quite enjoyable to relax there on the deck and just chill out and when you've had a few too many glasses sometimes the next day is not so easy <laughs> uh, do you have any remedies for hangovers uh, no no remedies just don't get old that's, that's <laughs> a, I, I found that one but you know just good greasy burger and uh, fries are always good um, question for you traveling the world abroad what's the best foreign wine you've ever drunk and the worst one. Worst one? I don't know. Worst one was probably in London in my cheap days, you know, backpacking, a couple of pounds, just open it up and give it a go. Favorite one, best one. I, oh, you know what? I think I had it here. It was a 98 Penfolds Grange. Uh, what's your opinion on wine critics and scores? Wow, these are tough questions today. <laughs> so, no, they have a place. So, like... For someone who's starting and want to get into wine, they're great. Uh, someone can learn a lot about about wines. And then um, I think some of them can be more educated, like uh, than like with scoring and stuff, like a structured tasting, judging, especially in the United States. But like in Australia, there's a, a setup for that. And but you know, um, it's a double-edged sword. So if you get good scores, you love them, but when they give you a bad one, ah, don't like you too much today, you know? So they have their place. Now, you know, we always say that each vintage tells a different story. Would you agree that there are more things that repeat themselves or not? The, yeah, vintages do have different stories. Like sometimes you could say, so this vintage uh, reminds me of the 12, like sometimes tannin's hard to get out so you're left with soft rich wine but there's one factor every vintage that throws you a curveball and that's mother nature and, you know last year we had had the fires before that we had um, a few years of drought and another year we had a, a lot of rain and you know each year's a, a challenge and that's the beauty about winemaking and mother nature is you got to make the best wine each year um, depending on what mother nature throws at you you know Absolutely. Speaking of harvests and vintages, do you have any rituals that you perform each year for harvest? No, uh, the, the only one I can say is after harvest, we have a big party. <laughs> that is the only one we uh, do, but we don't have any rituals or anything like that that we do. And do you capture any signs or omens each year that predict sort of the outcome of harvest other than what curveballs Mother Nature throws at you? No, I, I, I don't think so. So some people read tea leaves at the bottom of a teacup 
and it tells them something. If you could read what was at the bottom of a red wine glass, what would you want it to tell you? Well, red wine cup. How to make the best red wine with what we got and that everyone will love. <laughs> the real secrets. Yeah, yeah, the real secrets. So uh, if, if it could tell you when to thin, when to water, when to drop uh, crop, when to pick, and then what to do and in the cellar and everything like that, what barrels you should do, geez, we'll be set. <laughs> or just give me the lotto numbers and we'll be good too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, when you were little, what did you want to be when you grew up? <sighs> Apart from the superheroes, um, well, I, I wish I could have been a, a great sports player. I played Australian rules football, but I just, you know, lacked the talent. Um, yeah, I don't know. I thought I might have been... When I was younger, maybe a cop, and then changed, and I might have did some engineering, and then I fell into this, and now I'm happy being a winemaker, and, you know, the Napa Valley, I got a pretty good gig, so <laughs> I can't complain. And uh, not living in Australia anymore, football rules are different, so do you sp- still sp- play football, or are there any other sports you play? Uh, no, I don't, I haven't played it anymore, it's, uh, but I do watch it, so I know there's some leagues out here, I used to go and watch them play a little bit, but now it's just... <laughs> Sit at home and watch it on the telly, so... That's the most sport you do today? Yeah, yeah. That and chasing after kids. That would keep you pretty busy. Um, are you a supporter of any sports team? Yeah, so, like, uh, funny, I was back home when we did have American football on. I used to follow the, um, the 49ers and then the San Francisco Giants, so it's kind of funny I ended up here, so... So if one of those teams from San Francisco to, were to win, what uh, bottle of uh, wine would you give them to celebrate? Probably give them the uh, the Rombau Chardonnay. Yeah, that one would that would be a good one. Uh, for a really romantic evening, what wine would you order? Oh, any wine? Any wine. Any wine. Oh, well, you start off with some bubbles, of course. Maybe some French bubbles. Uh, had no way, Moe. That was really good. Maybe I'll start with that, and then nice big Shiraz. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I want you to complete the sentence. A table without wine is like... Watching grass grow. Okay. (laughs) I'm getting a visual. (laughs) And if a VIP of any... It could be anyone. It could be a celebrity in any walk of life was photographed by paparazzi in a restaurant and on their table was a bottle of your wine. Who would you want that celebrity to be? I know. Brad Pitt would be pretty cool, I reckon. If he can come and say good day, that'd be nice, you know. <laughs> and if your wine was a song, what song would it be? I don't know, it'd be a happy one. Yeah, I, I don't know, but uh, song, eh? It'll depend on the variety. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get we'll get into that yeah. in a, in a minute. <laughs> what was the best piece of advice you ever received? Just uh, best piece of advice. Well, it's pretty, just enjoy the moment that you're in, and, and uh, don't always look at tomorrow, you know, because then you're missing out on today. And if you were going to give us advice, would you give us the same advice, or is there something else you would say? Yeah, yeah. I'm not very good at giving advice. <laughs> if you're young, uh, work hard, but party hard as well. Um, <laughs> as you get older, it's just work hard, but enjoy your family and friends. What is your proudest achievement in your work? You know what? Probably, probably the consistency of being able to our Chardonnay and being able to improve it over the years. That would probably be our biggest one. And then also... Getting our cabs up to par, being able to do that here, and I think it's been a good achievement. You know, we're not done, we're going to keep improving, but uh, I think, yeah, that. Do you think people will still be drinking wine in 2,000 years? Yes. And what do you think they'll be drinking even in 100 years? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. It depends on climate change, I guess. (laughs) We'll just have to adjust our palates to it. Yes, (laughs) exactly. A lot of producers walk in their cellars and talk to their barrels. Now, I've been in your caves. They're very large. Um, there's a lot of barrels in there. But do you ever talk to them? And if so, what do you say to them? Oh, well, you know what? In, when I was in the cellar, it's actually where I talked to it was probably the yeast. When, when we're making the yeast and making sure the ferment goes well, I call them my babies, you know, because you know, if, if you don't, don't take care of them, they're not going to ferment. So more than that, but uh, yeah, we the barrels I just say just just stay good (laughs) but you know we don't talk to the barrels fantastic um where's a winemaking area in the world that you'd like to explore still you know I'd love to go back to uh Bordeaux and um around there France and just because when I was there when I was younger 
I was young and just like, oh, it's cool. I didn't appreciate it. And now that I know a lot more, it would be cool to go back and just try more wines. And, and then, well, there's also like, you know, Italy and Spain. That'd be cool too, you know. We get a lot of interns from, from that area. It'd be, be great to go see what they're doing as well. Of all the countries in the world and all the populations, who do you think drinks the best wine? Uh, you know, probably the States. Oh, you think about the East Coast, you get all the French wines over there, and, and then here you got Napa Valley, Sonoma, and Santa Barbara down that way. So I'll say the States. What are three wines you would take with you to a deserted island? Probably, well, one would be Bubbles. What wine would be? I don't know, maybe, oh, it's got to be something better. Maybe some Krug. Yeah. <laughs> maybe a Rosé Krug. And then uh, maybe a Red. I don't know. I add. <laughs> can, can I throw a slab of beer in there too? Sure, you can throw a beer in there. Every good winemaker likes a beer. Yeah, it takes a lot of, a lot of beer to make good wine. Absolutely. Um, just as we come to, we're almost finished, but as we come to the end of this, one of the things we do with Wine Soundtrack is we like to play a little game where I'll throw out a few varieties, yeah. and I want you to tell me what music you would be listening to, what either makes you think of or what you'd want to listen to while you're drinking it. So we're going to start with a refreshing, crisp Sauvignon Blanc. Oh, uh, yeah, probably some 80s. <laughs> it's terrible, I know. 80s pop music? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bon Jovi, all that fun stuff, you know? Okay. Yeah, it's horrible. What about a big, buttery, creamy Chardonnay? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm probably go up to the next generation, the 90s. I'm a 90s kid, too, so that's good. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, to be honest, music, I'm, I'm not big on just like top 40 radio. Um, no country though, no country music, but everything that pops pretty good. Okay, so pop music and wine. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Luke, thank you so much for joining us today. And before we go, if you can remind people where they can find your wines, um, your tasting room, website. Yeah, so uh, the website's rombau.com and uh, we're up in St. Helena and you can hit us up uh either by phone or uh, on the on the internet and send us an email and you can if you're out there you can uh, call us or look online for the location and put in your postcode and find out where your local Rombau is near you fantastic and if you do want to visit here be sure to make an appointment because they are by appointment only yes that's great thank you no worries thanks for having me cheers Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack USA. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com.